uh, I've laid down for our speakers a very, very strict time schedule. <laughs> Each of them has agreed to speak for 25 minutes and no more. Supposed to be on mic here. Hello? Yeah. Now we're done? Oh, I see. Okay. Well, once again, thank you all for coming and welcome. I laid down some maybe draconian rules for the participants. They each agreed to speak for 25 minutes. I'm going to observe the rule that while they speak, we won't allow any interruptions. I mean, if you have questions to ask, there's a piece of paper on every sheet. Write down your name, write down the name of the speaker to whom that is addressed, and somebody, wave your hand, somebody will collect it, and I'll sort them out before the question uh, and answer session begins. You know, I've trying to, we're, we're focusing on employment trends and related, in, in related areas like quality of employment, female labor force participation rate, employment in different age groups, etc. And I've, I've really tried to say that, look, this purpose of this session is not to build an entire narrative. It's to just get clear why is it that people seem to have different views. <laughs> Has employment increased enough or not increased? What's happened to real wages, et cetera? And obviously, this is due to different sources of data. Okay? And what I've tried to suggest to them is that the rules they follow for discussion will be firmly anchored in our own ancient Indian tradition and follow the Naya Sutras, which distinguish three types of discussion. One is just Vaad, where knowledgeable people agree on the rules. The purpose of the discussion is to learn what's happening, not necessarily to win an argument, but let the audience understand what the issues are. The second is Jalpa, where the purpose is not to find out the facts. The purpose is to win your argument. I mean, that's what lawyers do. It's not your job to bring in what may be relevant for the other side. Uh, you just win your argument, but you must work logically. And the third form of discussion, well identified in the Nyaya Sutras, is Vitand. And that is just you insult anyone you want, what you see as TV anchors. Now, I mean, they of course will never indulge in the latter, but I also urge them, don't focus too much on the Jalpa part, where you're putting forward a narrative and using the facts to defend the narrative. That can be quite complicated. This is an area where when I talk to people, they say, we're really confused. What is happening? Is employment increasing or not increasing? Is it terrible? Are real wages stagnant or not, et cetera? So I think they will speak for 25 minutes. Each will have a presentation. Uh, we will stop the discussion at the end of, I give some kind of signal that your time is running out. Mm -hmm. And then we have a good question and answer session. So with those words, and maybe thank both Sujit and Santosh as one of the uh, members of the audience said to me uh, that they're really happy that I have managed to get two of the principal contestants in this area to speak together. So you know that you're already seeing something quite valuable, uh, people who will have different views and they will share them with you. So thank you all, thank you for coming. And uh, now, Santosh, you're going first. So all over to you. Right. I just want, I want to clarify whether I'm managing the slides or you are. I'm not, but you are. <laughs> Would I have the laptop? Ah, the click out. Yes, it's great, great, great. But thank you very much uh, to CSEP for inviting me and for organizing this. this is very, very useful. Can you be heard? No, again, the line is on. Ah, better. I have my own stopwatch, I can assure you. Um, so India's employment challenge, I, I'm going to be focusing pretty much on the facts. And, um, so this is the structure of my presentation. And what is the official narrative? I'll begin with that. Pre-2019, as well as post-2019, the narrative is, is new slightly. 
what's the reality in, in according to the numbers as emerges from the government's own data? Uh, the two things that stand out from the data clearly is one thing that there has been a remarkable increase in the share of agriculture in total employment and an absolute increase of 60 million, 200, 260 million in the last three to four years alone. And there's actually secondly been a reversal of structural change, a reversal of structural change, which is remarkable. Um, third question I plan to deal with is how many non-farm jobs does India need to create? Not just jobs, how many non-farm jobs important. That's what's going to ensure, that's what's going to ensure uh, structural change, uh, an increase in non-farm jobs. You need to speak a little louder this. Yeah, sure, I'll do that. Is that one of construction jobs? Um, anyway, um, so I'll, I'll move on and then I'll turn, of course, in, at the end towards uh, to, to the... We're in story. Um, and why jobs and informality is There's something else, uh, additional that I'll deal with. So the official view of uh, joblessness has pre-2019 systematically has attempted to sort of say a series of things which I want to very briefly deal with. The first is they trash the CMI data. I trust me, I don't use the CMI data. It has issues, but it has a larger sample size than NSO's PMFS. It covers the organized and the unorganized sector. It covers both the rural and the urban areas, and it uses ILO compliant definitions, and this is very important, uh, which unfortunately, increasingly, PLFS has not been doing something we tried to change. So it's not to be, you know, poo poo the CMIE data, but nevertheless, and because it's internationally compliant, uh, most of the media does tend to use just CMIE data and, and less uses the PLFS. Next, uh, an, uh, an official view has been PLFS is not comparable to the employment and employment round of 11 and 12 and earlier rounds. So don't compare. It's, you know, but the fact of the matter is that the NSO itself compares, 1718 compares uh, numbers with 2004 and 2011. So why is someone in ETI over others actually claiming this? Next, another view, of course, has been that since 2019, 2020, LFPR and WPR has been rising, and the unemployment rate has been falling. But that ignores, unfortunately, the unpaid family labor phenomenon. It completely, if you eliminate, in fact, the unpaid family and unpaid family labor phenomenon, which has gone up by 50 million across the economy in the last three, four, three to four years, 50 million. Um, then the WPR and LFPR actually falls, and you, you unemployment rate begins to rise. And uh, the fact of the matter is, the unemployment rate, which was 10 million, or unemployment total absolute, uh, was 10 million in 2012. Uh, we added uh, to that stock uh, from 20 million by 2017-18, and that's how 17-18 was the year of the highest open unemployment rate. And even if you look beyond that, the unemployment rate may have fallen thanks to the UFL, the unpaid family labor phenomenon. But the fact is, it's still 28 million in absolute. And youth unemployment rate is still double that of 2012. That's a fact. And the neat number, not in education, employment, in training, that's the youth who are NEET, has also doubled. So if in the light of all this, an official narrative continues, well, there's very little more to be said. Uh, there are more dimensions of this. How can GDP not have returned to pre-COVID levels without employment having recovered? Well, we should have occasion to discuss that. GDP can recover due to the organized sector improving without the unorganized sector actually recovering. And that's precisely a problem I, which I will try and demonstrate. It's been a V-shaped recovery, no question. Good thing, but it's been a K-shaped recovery. That's the bottom line. The, another repeated message that comes out from the government, especially from the chief economist of the SBI, is that 
EPFO new registrations are rising, so formal jobs are rising. And the claim is that these are new jobs. Hmm? But formality may be rising. We certainly allow for that, but not jobs. And even formality may not have risen because EPFO is constantly revising downwards, upwards, etc. Anyway, I'm going to move on very quickly um, to what are the recent takes. I'm glad that, you know, Professor Goldar is here, Professor Surendra Parwai is also here. So, the recent uh, India Claims report has claimed the following, that employment grew actually by about 8 crore in the last 3 to 4 years. Uh, 3, three years of COVID. is not. 3 years of COVID, it grew by 80 million. And the SBI chief economist has been spreading this, but there are question marks about, about, about this. What are the sort of question marks around this? Well, let's look at them. Uh, one, how did employment grow in India when the IRA is telling us in, the, in East Asia, Southeast Asia, and pretty much everywhere else in the world, employment was actually stagnant over the last few years as a result of the impact of COVID and so on. Anyway, we'll return to this subject. PLFS, which is apparently the source of the claims, analysis, PLF has shown an increase from 54 crores to 57 crores over that three years. It's a three year, three crore increase. So where does this eight crore come? RBI collects data. That's the third point I want to make. It funds research. It's been funding claims research. Very good. They use PLFS. We also use PLF. But you know what is the main purpose of, of the PLFS? It's the main use of, sorry, main, main use of claims is to estimate essentially the TFP, the total activity. But you know, you go on to sort of make many other claims based on that, you get into all sorts of issues. Claims ignores PLFS, show, uh, show, the, it ignores the fact that PLFS shows employment structure has changed. The positive structural change that was taking place underway since 2003 has actually now been reversed. And it's been reversed in the wrong direction, unfortunately. So that the Lucian trans transition that was happening has actually been reversed. So the one claim is the claims report is that eight new jobs were created in four, four years, and the PM has actually uh, tom tom that. And at the same time, the claim is that female FPR has risen. But of course, it's mainly risen in agriculture. So let's just look a little bit further that inside what's happening in the in respect of that. Um, right. Uh, the increase in that in ag agri workforce is seen as a rise in employment. Now, this is a point of view in the official point of view, which is essentially saying. It doesn't matter which sector employment is increasing, even if it's in agriculture. 60 million workers increase in agriculture, complete reversal of structural change. You go from 200 million to 260 million, wonderful thing. Employment is increased. It's jobful growth. So, rural women in agriculture, you've seen an increase. Rural women in, in self employment, you've seen an increase in the last three, four years. Subsidiary workers for rural women rises. These are all worst forms of employment that you can think of. And it's a reversal of the trend of women leaving agriculture since 2004. It's, this is a very important thing that I think we all need to recognize. What's the, what do we need to recognize? That for 50 years before independence, before 2004, the absolute number of workers in agriculture was always rising. The share of workers in agriculture was falling, but the absolute number of workers in agriculture, in agriculture was always rising. Because the structural change process was very slow. But for the first time after 2004, you get a hastening of the structural change. Millions of workers begin to leave agriculture for the first time. Loosing you know, transition really begins. Real wages begin to rise because non farm jobs are growing at a rate of seven and a half million per annum. And the rise in agriculture, jobs are seen as positive in the government narrative. Um, and let's just remember this. Unpaid family labor was in, in both rural and urban areas 
falling between 2004 and 12 when the non-farm jobs are going back. The unpaid family labor in rural areas was falling and it fell dramatically. I can show the numbers are here. And sort of, so for instance, UFL rose in the Atal period from 2000 to 2004, from 77 million to 100 million. Then after that, as non-farm jobs begin to grow rapidly, it falls to 55 million in 2018-19. And as non-farm jobs grew, agriculture was shedding workers and women were leaving as well. But the opposite happens, forgive me. Opposite was happening post-2019, you get a rise to 95 million from 55 million in rural areas of unpaid family. Dramatic 40, 45 million increase in that. Now, if you think this is a positive development, be my guest. Uh, however, there is a, a slight twist to this official view, which I'm sure we will, we will hear from Dr. Mahila, that the rise in female LFPR in rural areas is partially, but only very partially, as his own data will tell me, and I have the data too, and I won't go in depth into this, but its share is actually quite small. It's true that it's gone into livestock. It's a good thing that it's gone into livestock. That diversifying in rural areas, very good thing. No question about it. But its share is so small that I'm not so sure that girls who have gotten second, secondary education or more, and there's been a universalization of secondary education. And of, you know, there's been a rapid increase in girls' enrollment in higher education. I'll tell you the numbers shortly. They have no desire to be doing livestock work in rural areas. Their mother used to do it. They don't want to be doing, it, doing this. They want to get the hell out of the rural areas. This is their father's did, and their mothers had left. Moving on. Another part of the narrative is that, you know, the 1904 period was, had better job record than UPA. And similarly, the similar narrative, post-2014, better jobs record than, 20, post, uh, than, than the UPA period in 2004. Really? Let's see. In the first period, 1999-2004, there's a 60 million increase in the total workforce. Of which 22 million is in agriculture. You, you get excited by 22 million absolute increase in agriculture. Again, be my guest. However, there is a positive development in the sense that the remaining 38 million is in you know, manufacturing, in construction, in modern services. Very good. And I've always said in my analysis, it's not the first time I'm saying it is that since 2000, our economy has been generating and did generate for a 12-year period 7.5 million new non-farm jobs every year. So we can do it. We've done it before. We can do it again. We don't, we don't have the time to how we can do it again, but certainly not the way we are, we are, we've been attempting to do it in the last 10 years. Moving on quickly. Then there is a the claim that, oh, UPA jobs has been great, job creation rate has been very slow. No recognition of the following facts. One, the young people, both under 40 as well as for over 14, were going to school in a, at a rate that had never seen, been seen in our country. It's a positive development because what you got was universalization of primary enrollment, pretty much thereafter, by 2000, uh, between 2007 and 20, universalization of elementary education, and between 2010 and 2015, that universalization of secondary education because of the upward pressure. And then you get higher education enrollment shooting up, shooting from 11% to 27% in a matter of 10 years between 2006 and 2017 on a rising base of the of the, of the population, of the, of the 18 to 23 cohort. So, you know, this argument just doesn't sell. Okay, um, most importantly, I want to remind you of the fact, moving on, for the first time in India's history, non-farm jobs began to increase at the rate of seven and a half million, that, non, that farm jobs actually fell in absolute terms. 
just want to drive home this point, which is a, you know, the labor market tightness. And because the labor market tightens, which it wasn't tightening until, uh, until 2004, real wages increase, as I will go on to demonstrate very shortly. And then, of course, somehow people who make this, these comparisons of time forget about what happened to the open unemployment rate. We're talking about open unemployment. 10 million in 2012 rises to 30 million in 1783 because of the series of policy shocks, uh, policy induced shocks. The rate of open unemployment goes from 2% in 2012 to 6.1%. 6 it's just tripling. Youth unemployment goes from 6% to 18%. Huh? Why needs are rising? Not in education and employment. Youth, youth needs are rising. They rise above 100 million, as you will see for. Rising discouraged workers. And 83% of the unemployed are youth. Um, then the final claim, of course, which is made is about the 2014-2024 period, is that yes, but the youth unemployment rate has fallen and it's only confined to the, to the period, uh, the age group of 15 to 29. And after 29, the youth unemployment, the unemployment rate comes down to 1%, which is sort of pretty frictional unemployment and it's global. So what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is that for 10 years these youngsters were looking for jobs and they didn't find it. And if it drops because they find some work to do, that's why the share of informality is 90% in our workforce. Is that what we want to continue to do? Is that what we want to continue to do? 90% of our workforce is informal, has been so for decades. Are we going to be that, that in 2047? That's the way it's looking. Let's move on. The recent narrative of the government, massive unorganized sector fall, uh, jo jobs fall, was due to COVID in 2021, 20, uh, second wave in particular. And then, of course, there's been a recovery. Now, the, what does this ignore? It ignores three dimensions of the ASUS data. The unorganized sector enterprises survey, released recently just after the election results were, as you can expect, just as the PLFS, 1718 was released just a week after the 2019 election results were announced. What do they tell us? One, the first finding is interesting. First, look at the number of establishments. We've got 2010 figures, 2015 numbers, and then we've got 21 numbers, and then 22, 23. So what's what we what I will summarize in the interest of time, you can study this if you're interested later. One, five million potential units are, are destroyed. Where are the units? The very first, very first rose the number of establishments. Five million potential units are destroyed, estimated using what was happening to the number of establishments, how it was growing between 10 and 11 and 15, and then what happens after, after that. Second finding, Two million actual jobs are lost because we are saying 111 goes down to 109.6. But potential jobs lost at 8 million because we're looking at what was happening to jobs in the unorganized sector between 2010 and 2015-16. And finally, look at the last row. Hired workers establishments come down. Why was all this happening? It was happening because of the policy induced shocks. So, the demonetization, the DSA, etc. Moving on very quickly. How much more time do I have? Ten minutes. Yeah. I'll, <clears throat> I have, yeah, because after this, I have 10 or 11 pictures, so I'll go through that very quickly. I can show you. So why do you have the job slowing down? There was clearly an economic slowdown after 2016, from 2016 to 21, 22. We know that from the GDP data. And these were, it was these policy-induced shocks, demand, badly designed, poorly implemented, GST, about which we've heard Arvin Sobranium talk very eloquently here in this very room just a few weeks ago. And then national lockdown, one of the strictest in the world, in a country of 140 billion people. China didn't do it. 
South Africa didn't do it, not as far as notice, but we did it. So we contracted at double the rate that the global economy contracted in FY21. We contracted at 5.8%, global economy contracted at 5.1%. So, so over that the 10-year period, 78 is was the growth rate between in UK period. It's down by two percentage points to 5.8 for the last 10 years. And this reversal of structure is my suspicion is it could be deep enough to be. I mean, the, 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 the changes that have taken place could be enough to be structural. Yeah? Because all growth drivers have been impacted. What? Well, let's look at each of the four growth drivers. One, first growth driver, private consumption. It's being maintained post-recovery, but maintained by cuts in household savings, which fell from 24% of uh, GDP to 17%. First, it's recovered somewhat. But it's risen, but at a cost of retail debts rising, and PFC of upper, mid, upper and middle, middle classes doesn't can't offset the fact that non-farm jobs are growing slower, and they're growing much slower than needed, as we as I will demonstrate shortly. And the unorganized sector has barely recovered, as I showed in the last slide. So patient recovery continues to be so. GFCF, second driver, well, the average for the investment to GDP ratio in the last 10 years has been between 26 and 31 percent in that range. 2004 to 14, the investment rate to GDP never fell below 31 percent. Here it's barely reached 31 percent at its peak. 31% to 38% over a 10 year period. That's why the growth rate was average at 7.8%. And, you know, public investment can't compensate for the fact that private investment is not picking up as capacity utilization remains at under 75%. And the semi investment is not growing. That's the point. <laughs> exports, third driver, exports were growing at 15% since 1992, all the way to 20. 16. And exports to GDP rose as a result 10 to, from 10 to 25%. That's Chinese levels of export to GDP ratio. And of course, it is that in And the absolute maximum value 2013-14 dollar value of ex merchandise exports $318 billion. Never achieved again for the next five years. In the Next five years after the, this government comes to power. It's lower after that. Services exports can offset this fall, but there, there are limits with deglobalization. It has offset it, but only in the recent years. Core driver, but well, clearly, when growth rate slows, um, where is the fiscal space? The debt, debt to GDP ratio be no present. So, yet there is a a narrative about the recovery. What's the narrative now, recently? Again, that we've become the fastest growing large economy in the world, fast growing economy. India is because of new India economy. What's the new India economy? But that's, it's recognized that it's 15% of the uh, overall economy, but it's central to grow. HSBC, Morgan Stanley, S&P, all, all telling us this. And of course the government now, and, and the value media is spreading. It's a partial truth. No one's denying this, as, as, as I will say, as you will see. Very quickly, two main sectors are highlighted appropriately. Goods on the good side, mobile handsets, pharma, auto, and invest growing, you know, gaining global market share since 2017. Then, of course, then there's the IT sales of two types. One, India is no, no, no longer a giant call center as it was in the 90s. Nor is, so, I mean, nor is it a sort of software services provider, as it was in the 2000s. It's selling legal, accounting, et cetera, services. And it's become a hub of GCC, Global Capability Centers, 1,200 of them. Absolutely spot on, correct? And then, of course, the tech startups in the various areas. Let me move on quickly. Yet, on a, despite these new economy, the same HSBC, et cetera, still say, GDP expands only by 6.5% over the next decade. 
It's higher than the 6% pre-COVID, but it's not good enough to create the jobs. That This is their, their own narrative that it's not good enough to generate the number of jobs that's needed. And in any case, no international agency, OEC, World Bank, IMF, is saying that our growth rate is over the 2030s until 2030 is going to be higher than 6.5 to 6.7%. Latest revision. So it doesn't create the 70 million jobs that they believe are needed over the next decade. 70 million? That's an underestimate as I will show. Okay? They themselves admit would generate only one third of job needs. Because old India is 85% of the economy, new India is only 15%. If it lacks the case, how is old India to be energized? That remains a question mark, especially in an economy where there are 66 million MSMEs, 70% of it are not even registered anywhere in the government. I have old paper about this. Moving on very quickly, I think it's very important for all of us. You have to speed it up and get real wages. I'm, I'm just getting there, sir. Otherwise, you won't finish in time. I'm, I'm, I, I assure you that my, all the rest of this after this are all pictures. Um, <laughs> So, what we learned from this graph, our demographic dividend is ending in 15 years flat by 2040. Don't be misled by what Ajit Chibar told us. That's not what the way it is. This, these are hard numbers which have been studied for some time. What evidence do I, do I have? 49% of our workforce, of our workforce, is over the age of 45. That means in 15 years, they'll be at retirement age. We are an aging society. We may pretend as long as we do that we are not. We are still young, but we have to provide millions of new jobs. How many? We have four demographic loops, each a looming crisis, very quickly. First, 15 to 29 years old. We've already talked about that. My estimate is, carefully done, that based on the current labor force uh, LFPR and expecting that it will rise because the youth LFPR is still only 44%. The overall LFPR is only 42%. The global average is, for, is 60%. We want to see higher you know, LFPR, no question. Uh, but we are graduating about 10 million you know, engineers and other graduates every year. At the current rate of LFPR, you know, at least six million jobs each year have to be found. More as we move, go along. Next, very big subgroup of this is girls who don't want to be sitting at home. A survey of by the Randy Foundation in 2019, 70,000 across the globe, across the country, asked the question: What age do you want to get married? 21% said, 25% 20, uh, said between the ages of 18 and 20. 51% said between the ages of 20 and 25. If they're going to be, they want to be themselves married at that age or beyond, what is that saying? We've gotten, we've, we've studied, we want to work. Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, rural areas, it doesn't matter. I've been there, I've seen them. That's a flow. The stock, landless workers, we've already increased too many work, right? If you don't pull them, pull workers out of agriculture, no, forget about Vixit Bar. Next, the stock of unemployed has been already talked about. Youth needs, I haven't said anything about that, but I'm now going to sort of show you a slide. Moving on very quickly. Moving on. Open unemployment rates, yes, they've fallen. They have indeed fallen in the last three or four years. A very significant reason for that, as I, I can prove to you, is because of unpaid family labor. And girls are joining unpaid family labor. So you may be, be pleased about that. But the fact of the matter is, there's a massive surge compared to 2012, which is the first bar, even after the decline. And look, these are... 
अनएम्प्लॉयमेंट लेंगे बाय एजुकेशन लेंगे बाय एजुकेशन लेंगे प्लीज लो हाउ दे एक्स शॉर्ट है यू वांट टू नो दिस बी माय डेस यंग वुमेन इवन वर्स 2012 वर्सेस 22 23 डोंट हैव द टाइम टू गो इनटू दिस लेट मी वेल हाफ अ मिनट ऑन ऑन नीड्स दिस इज द पार्ट ऑफ द यूथ पॉपुलेशन 15 to 29 years. That point is evident. I suggest you go on. Yeah, I'm going on. Real wages. Yeah. All my good. slides are now about real wages. Six of them, and I'm, I'm stopping there, sir. Two minutes. Two minutes is, what, is all I will take. Have a look. Have a look at the numbers from 2004 to 2012 when I was saying non farm jobs were growing, workers were being pulled out of agriculture, labor market was tightening. So clearly, real wages are rising in rural India. However, post-2017 or 2018, certainly, they have stagnated and they haven't shown much rise, which is exactly what you would expect as non-farm job growth goes down, falls off. And the debate that Sujit has had with John Grace demonstrates what I'm saying is right and unfortunately, real, real wages, urban, urban areas, regular salary, same story, 2004 to 2012, rising, but then stagnating. Next, agriculture, self-employed earnings, casual wage worker, and then regular wage worker. So you can see between four, five, rising all the way, and then stagnating. Next, manufacturing. Same story. Next, construction. Pretty much the same story. Services, self-employed earnings is the is the blue is the blue in the middle. Regular salary on top and casual day. Pretty much the same story. Finally, and this is very important. I'm pretty much closing penultimate slide probably. Look at the, the numbers of those who earn in 22-23 a real wage of less than 100 or less than 200. You've got the less than 100 in the first set of bonds, between 100 and 200. 200 is the Pakora wage. Pakora wage will give you a, a, an earnings for the month for a family of five, which is Slightly below the Tendulkar poverty line for rural areas. Um, and, and, sorry? No, that's not including the trust fee. That's fine. You can slap in whatever you may wish to for that. However, those who are vulnerable between 200, I mean, is, has to be counted as well. If you were to add the 100 in the, less than 100 in the 200, it's around two thirds of the of the workers. Moving on. Unorganized sector, last slide I'm closing. <laughs> Real wages also stagnate. And I, let me admit, as I doff my hat to Dr. Bhalla, that poverty can fall even if real wages are stagnating. And I tend to go along with that argument. Real wages have stagnated and manufacturing, this is showing, has actually taken a massive beating in the unorganized sector. Okay? I will stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you a lot, Thank you very much. Sorry if I rushed you. No, no, we no, have no. limited time. Now we have Suji. Yeah. Should we agree with that extra time that he took? So it'll all be even. Okay? That will go past. <laughs> no, no, no. 515. <laughs> not 515. You'll get a little more than half an hour. Okay? Look. May not need it actually. Ah, now we're talking. <laughs> Let me just set this up, and we are in business. Yeah. Why did this light go off by itself? Okay. Thank, Thank you very much. much. It's audible? Yes. Thank, Thank you. you.
And thank you, Montek, uh, for organizing this. And thank you, Santosh, for your presentation. Uh, <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> the ILO, and this is, you know, a lot of the story about employment, wages, etc., has to do with data, almost by definition. This quote is by the ILO. And it says, in the model of labor force participation, the PLFS observations for 2018 and 2019 have been excluded as they appear to present limited comparability with both the previous NSS results and the newer PLFS results. Translated, we can't trust the 1718 and 1819 government's own must be data. Okay. This is unprecedented. I do not know any other time that the ILO, it covers every country in the world, has reported this um, and, and reported in <clears throat> four to five years after the completion and dissemination of the surveys. Interesting enough, again on data, the call that MOSPI's 2017-18 consumer expenditure data was also thought to be of deeply questionable quality, which is why it was not released. A recent report from the IO documents how unrepresentative those data were. So we have to study this, and Montego suggests uh, yet another seminar for you, uh, <clears throat> that you know how unprecedented it is that government's own surveys for two identical years um, are not representative of anything, okay? And <clears throat> they do not, and I think they do not reflect reality. <clears throat> now, jobs. Everybody's talking about it. Gita Gautunath, IMS Deputy MD, emphasized that India needs 60 to 148 million jobs between now and 2013. Simple translation, either it can be 9 million a year or 21 million a year. So let's just stay 15 million a year. Now, <clears throat> the unfortunate reality is that people don't look at, or economists, who should be, the first thing they should be looking at is supply and demand, and don't look at the demographics. And the demographics are <clears throat> really suggest the following. Past fertility decisions mean that basically the supply of humans in India is declining, and <clears throat> we need to examine the job crisis in the face of the supply crisis, as it were, which I'll soon show. IMF, I, Gita Gopinath, 15 million jobs a year. Raghuram Rajan, 10 to 12 million jobs a year. But, <clears throat> what about the expected supply of labor? And I will soon talk about that. Uh, the claims data <clears throat> has been talked about, and note, it's only for the 20, for the 23-24 uh, extrapolation. They don't have the PLFS data. Um, they come out with a very outlandish number that 47 million jobs were created. That's an extrapolation. That's a, a forecast. Uh, unlikely to be very real, as uh, I think Santosh has also pointed out. And so therefore, the claims data, as well as the pen world tables, these are the authoritative uh, tables or whatever, what they have are authoritative figures on the labor market, <clears throat> they, have, they use a simple definition, the same definition for labor, not for the forecast, but when they analyze from 1983 onwards, the definition is very straightforward, greater than or equal to 15 years, and the usual status of employment. 
And this has been done from 1983 to now. So 22, 23, just discount. And I think uh, Santosh also discounts, completely agree. That has nothing to do with the price of tomatoes. Okay, <clears throat> this is what a very important graph needs to be looked at. This looks at the, su the supply. And notice, and the, the last bar, the years didn't come out here, but uh, basically where the, the dark line and the blue line meet, etc. that's 22, 23. Which means that at that time, there were 10 million of working age, um, 15 to 64, and working age. Whether they worked or not is relevant. There are only 10 million potential supply. So if they, everybody worked, it'd be 100% uh, working participation rate, which obviously is not the case. At 60% and 70%, 80%, you get down to only 6 million jobs a year are needed. And we have <coughs> distinguished experts saying, 10 million, 12 million, 50 million jobs are needed where they will get it. It could be that we need to improve the structure of the jobs, et cetera, but you really cannot uh, make humans that easily unless you allow a lot of migration into India, okay? So just keep that in mind. Whenever we're talking about jobs, unless the population data and the fertility data are all wrong, which nobody, to my knowledge, has disputed. So let me put it clearly. And let's take 70 million as a labor force participation rate for women. For men, 90%. What that means is that the new supply coming into the market is no more than about 7 million. So we need to create 7 million jobs so that the unemployment rate doesn't go up. Now, if there's a stock of unemployed, then clearly for a few years, etc., you can have more than 7 million, 8 million, 9 million. But a long-term basis, that's all you need. Okay? And without getting into, oh, I need good quality jobs, I need non-agricultural jobs or whatever, certain jobs are 7 million. Now, <clears throat> let me have a glass of water. So. So this is very important. The whole story of unpaid family labor. Until recently, some economists were saying that the ILO does not consider unpaid family labor as work. Okay? Every country in the world has unpaid family labor as part of its labor status. The definition is for pay or profit. Unpaid family labor means I work maybe with my wife, she runs a shop, I help her run the shop, and therefore I will be unpaid, she gets paid. Okay? Both are working. And for definitions forever and ever, this has been the case. Second, a lot has been made about unpaid family labor going up. And <clears throat> what we have there, which is the arrow that, this one, oops, I knew I would do something. Oops. <laughs> How did I get on to the other one? There you are. <laughs> okay, we're back. Okay. Look at the share of unpaid family labor to total employment. Share of unpaid employment to total employment. And that has, if you will, consistently gone down. From 99, it went up to 2004. We can ignore 2004. 19.9% is the current weekly status. Then it was 16.4% in 2011-12. Notice. Through the entire expansion of labor, of employment in India, 
the share of unpaid family labor has gone down. So the argument that this is all unpaid family labor that is causing this is not very tenable, to say the least. It's 15.5% now, and so I think this is very, very important to look at this fraction. Total employment goes up, unpaid family labor in, in numbers goes up, but not in ratios. Okay, we have to be very careful about, we notice 10 more people working and say, oh my God, there's a problem. That's not, got to look at the ratio. Uh, as economists, that's what we, econ 101. Now, <clears throat> let's look at unemployment, okay? Now, we have the NSS data, 99, 2004, 2011. The employment, unemployment survey, which is done by the Labor Department, I've given that data, and I'll give, tell you the reason why I've given that data. And then you have the PLFS 2019 onwards. As I said, <coughs> ILO has ruled out. I'm not going to use, though I will report some numbers for 17, 18, etc. But there's no point looking at 17, 18, and 18, 19. So let's just look at this. And one very... <coughs> interesting thing is that the <clears throat> unemployment rate in 2016, right, by the Employment Unemployment Survey <clears throat> was 3.9%. And 2019, it went up to 4.8. Okay. If you look at, look at the other numbers. And remember, in 1718, when the now defunct uh, PLFS survey came out, there was a big hoo-ha, 6% unemployment in India, highest it's ever reached, etc. And at least the ILO thinks that that number is not very credible. I think that number is not very credible, but be that as it may. But that's what I suggested, that we need to investigate what the hell happened in 1718 and 1819, that the two surveys that MOSPI did, government did, it's not private. Uh, and incidentally, the, both the surveys closely match the CMI survey. But never mind, that's another story. Okay, so what we have here is that unemployment rates are really not that different. And I'll show some more numbers. Now let's get to youth unemployment rates. And what we notice, and I would first look at the unemployment rate 30 to 64 years for the last in 99, and then actually the numbers go back to 1983 as well. And the unemployment rate for 30 to 64 is really very, very low. And in the last year, 22-23, it was only 0.6%, which is almost the lowest it's ever been. They are 99 and 2011 was 0.4. I don't want to make too much of that. It's very low. Then I've given you the ratio of 15 to 29 to 30 to 64. This was the ILO study, which is no longer on the, apparently on their website uh, with the Institute of Human Development, Institute of what is ISD. Uh, which no longer is on the website. Why that has been taken out, I don't know. But as you saw, <clears throat> the last couple of months, etc., this was a real sensation that all the unemployment is amongst the youth and so on and so forth, highest it's ever been. And actually, it turns out it's not. But that's the story about the data and this. Next. Well, Sujit, you want to go back uh, to the Sorry? 13 to 29? Yeah. The chart you just showed. <clears throat> 15 to 29. Yeah, because you, you said 30 to 64 is very low. Yeah. But you missed the fact that in the 18 to 29, which yeah. is kind of young, yeah. really. Yeah. It, oh, that I've come to. Yeah. Yes. Okay. It's high. I'm not saying, but look at the ratio is what I'm talking about here. But let's look at the, uh, the 18 to 29, why it's high. And the story there is, I might as well cover it now. It's a story worldwide. 
has to do with unlimited supplies of skilled labor, which I'll come to in a minute, which I talked about earlier. It's not, it, it is not to say it doesn't exist in India, it is to say it exists everywhere, okay. except for the US. Why US is such an exception, I don't know. Okay. Now let's look at cross country. And Monte, this might answer some of your questions. There's 15 to 24 you lost, and <clears throat> the greater than equal to 25. And this is actually is <clears throat> a methodological question I have to all. And you know, how do you compare? Same question that Monte was asking, everybody asked, how do you compare how India is doing with other countries? Now we can choose, we can choose the topmost countries in whatever issue it is, uh, in growth rates, and then say India is lower than that, almost by definition. We can choose the topmost country in employment, labor force participation rate, and say India is lower than that. And we can all play those games. Okay? But this is not the equation. Uh, of playing games, I want to ask you, and later on you can comment, how do you evaluate how country X is performing relative to the world? Which means you need to have a comparator for the world. And each particular economic issue may have a different set of comparators. That's absolutely correct. For the case of labor markets, employment, we can't compare India with Sub-Saharan Africa, and we can't compare India with the Western countries, almost by definition. So what I've done over here, and this is a joint paper with Peter Das and Karim Basim uh, for the World Bank, and what we did was we looked at all of Latin America and all of Asia. Okay, seems like a very simple, straightforward comparison. How are we doing with respect to these countries? And when you do all of Asia, you take China out because it's a weighted average, and then you only get the China result. Uh, but anyway, so what we find then <clears throat> that the usual, I you know, during three years, 99, 2011, 22, and perhaps we can discuss why those three years, but let's concentrate on 2022. And what we have is that the unemployment rate in India by the usual status is 1.5% for ages greater than or equal to 25. And I've given 15 to 24 is higher, the point Montague noted, et cetera. It's 9% or 13.5%, depending on what definition you use. Let's look at the rest of the world. 15 to 24, the rest of the world is 11.2%. We are 9 according to CWS, which is the same definition as the rest of the world, and we are lower. And we are higher at 13.5% for a definition I prefer, which is usual status. But it's not... Let's not quibble about 11 and 13 and a half. We're exactly where the rest of the world is. And <clears throat> the same story with um, greater than or equal to 25, and there we are actually less than the rest of the world. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> now, as you know, one of the items that Monte wanted me to look at and asked to look at was female labor force participation rate. And <clears throat> rumor has been going around led by CMIE, which is why CMIE is not discussed, Santosh, is because they have female labor force participation rate at lower than Yemen and lower than Iraq and lower than any observation ever recorded in human and world history. That is why one doesn't look at the CMI data. Okay. <clears throat> so what I have got over here is now I'll talk about, basically, I want to look at, and this is not labor force participation rate, 
this is actually wages. Another issue is comes up. Women get paid less wages than men, etc. Let's look at advanced education. Ages 20 to 29, basically women have been earning the same as men, sometimes higher for most of those 20, 30 years. But let's say it's the same. 30 to 39 is also the same. And 40 and above is also the same. Male and females, men and women earn the same amount. However, let's look at intermediate education. And this is where the gaps occur. And as you can see, 40 and above intermediate education, the males were earning 40% more. And why that is the case, we can go into. But I think the this is a progression, has to do with the quality of education, etc. Now, I only wanted to highlight that women now earn the same as men in India. Not the story, now we could, I could always use the comparator of the US, where the number is close to 10% uh, after you adjust for all the human capital and so on and so forth. And many other countries are so high. <clears throat> okay. Now we come to labor force participation. Women don't work in India, okay? Female labor force participation, right? But I've reported men, women, and obviously all. And look at the number for 2022 all, and age is greater than or equal to 25. You know, the simple reason why you have to take age is greater than or equal to 25 is because of the big increase in education in India. So they are not in the labor force. You can't be two places at one time. So you can't be both a full-time student and in the labor force. The, the, the surveyors don't allow that. Uh, maybe some people do do that. But anyway, <clears throat> so what you have over here is that in 2022, the labor force, the weighted labor force participation for CWS was 61.5% for India, and for Asia and Latin America was 66.1, a little behind. But if you do the usual status, which as I said, Penwell tables and so on and so forth, is where we can discuss some other time why that is, it's identical. So maybe the whole world, the women are not working anymore. But 65 is a pretty solidly high number for women. In the US today, it's about 65%. So I don't understand the women not working in India or not participating in the labor force, et cetera. And, you know, so next. Here's another interesting bit. <clears throat> compare Korea and India. And Korea doing its time of expansion and India doing its. So in 20 to 23, female labor force participation rate, usual status in India was 41.9% and it was 41.7% in 1984 in Korea. And second, <clears throat> the aggregate labor force participation rate was 63% in Korea. It's higher in India, 65.1%. So let's be very careful before we damn uh, either the data system or the women not working, staying at home. And this is where I completely agree uh, with some those. One of few things we completely agree. They're not going to sit at home, twiddle their thumbs, OK? And they're not making babies anymore. So what else do you expect them to do? they are going out and working. And that, sorry for that comment on baby, but that is the big story about the transition in India and in the rest of the world. Fertility rates. You combine, and they are, both are interrelated, fertility rates with education, you get a revolution. And that's the revolution India is in today. Structure of jobs, okay. They're all in agriculture. They're not going up, etc. 
So I've divided, and actually the data comes out. You have to pour deep into the data. <clears throat> but basically, there is crop agriculture, which includes fruits and vegetables and what are called perennial uh, crops. And there is mixed farming, which includes animal farming and others. <clears throat> Very simply, the number of jobs in agriculture, crop agriculture, so 193 million in 2011, and 2022 is 172. It's declining. But, and the total may also be declining, I don't know, they have given you all, but mixed farming has gone up from 15, 15 million to 60.1. And I think Bina Agarwal had a recent article, et cetera, where, you know, this mixed farming and more productive methods, it's not as if that agriculture has to be go down, employment and agriculture has to go down to zero. Now, real wages. Okay. Um, this is PLFS and NSS data. Very simply, <clears throat> you have casual worker and salaried workers. As per the definition, starting in, as I said, 1983. And what you find, 2004 to 2011, casual workers was 5.5% per annum. Between 2019 and 22, is 5.4% per annum. And as I said, we're not using 17, 18, and 18, 19. For Below yeah, let's, let's keep it. Yeah, let's keep it for the thing. So you can take 19, you can take 20, you can take 21. This is the average rate of growth over those four years. It's not one particular year. So <clears throat> what you find is that salary workers, this is like, again, another seminar perhaps sometime. This shows that really post-2011, Salary workers are not earning. And this is again, Monte, a global story. <clears throat> um, and this is what I called before, unlimited supplies of skilled labor. I'll just give you one statistic. In 1993, college graduates in the Western world were 50 million. And this is, was published in the book of 2017. College graduates in the rest of the world, which is like uh, 6 billion versus 900 million, okay, was 50 million. In 22, 23, college graduates in the Western world has gone up from something 50 to 65, 60, 65. In the rest of the world, it's gone up to more than 300 million. So this is a global problem, not just. You look at unemployment rates for educated in France, in Germany, in England. You pick your country, and you will find that the un unemployment rates are higher for uh, the earnings growth, sorry, is flat, if not declining. OK? So basically, <clears throat> what was that? We're not in Kansas anymore and we're not in New Delhi anymore. Two minutes. The Absolutely. Now, <clears throat> real wages in rural India. A lot was made by the village level survey done by the uh, <clears throat> labor department, etc. And <clears throat> they are the non perennial rice wheat, etc. This was a debate that I had in the open pages of the Indian Express with John Dress. And here, if you look at the NSS data versus the data, NSS PLFS data versus the data uh, from the village level survey on wages, et cetera, that you find that things are very, very consistent and very compelling. <clears throat> now, the last slide, uh, Monte. This is also made, and I think uh, Santosh made this point. Um, you know, 8 million graduates are entering the labor force 
every year. They pass out. India passes out 8 million graduates a year. And I showed earlier that <clears throat> basically the total supply of uh, labor, of, not labor, of working age population is close to 8 million. And there are 8 million graduates. Now, it's a very unreasonable assumption, to say the least, to assume that all those 8 million graduates enter the labor force. Because what else are they going to do? Well, they enroll in further education. Okay? Then you have, this the first one is pass all levels of education. Now I'm looking at enroll. They pass from one level, go to the other, and that goes from uh, 5.7 million are enrolled. Net potential entry into the labor market, somewhere around 3 million. Then you look at the males have a much higher labor force participation rate. Let's make it universal, 95%. And then you do females, 70%, because they get married or they, they don't have as much entry into the labor force, less than the men, rising, but it's 70%. Whatever it is, you have the same number of people, the pressure on the labor market from the education side, from the graduate side, is exactly the same as in 2011, despite a massive increase in education. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Rudik. Uh, well, you know, I had said that if somebody had questions, they would be free to send them to me, but since no one has, I assume they are bring it over. Uh, maybe we should give Santosh a few minutes since he didn't have the advantage of knowing what Sujit was going to say, but Sujit did. So Santosh, you have two minutes. Thank you. I thought you said five. You said so yes, yesterday. Okay, well. Okay, it's, okay, okay. I'm going to make five points, but, you know, Just very pithily. Very pithily. First of all, not all of these workers in agriculture are, are unpaid family labor. I said it myself. It's only 15%. But 60 million were added to agriculture. We know that. It's absolutely clear. I have the numbers myself. Of course, we're going to look at the ratio. That's precisely the point. The ratio has gone up from 42% to 45-46%. Secondly, and I think this is very critical, you want to look at what these workers are doing in agriculture. I'll come back to this in a second. Secondly, where is the supply of workers we being asked? So where are we getting you know, 10 to 12 million and Gita Gopinath is going overboard and as, is, as everyone else? Well, I talked about four types of workers who need jobs, and they're clearly a looming crisis. You don't want to believe that. I'm not saying that, we are, that the labor force participation rate of the, of the graduates is going to be 80% to 90%, but it's at least going to get close to the, to the global average. So what is the global average? Let's just remind ourselves. The overall LFPR in India, Latest number, 42%. What's the world average? 60%. So clearly, we need to get our LFPR up. More people have to be provided jobs. And female LFPR, 28% in 22-23. The world average is way higher. As, I mean, I, 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 let, listen to the youth LFPR. We are focusing on youth LFPR. You know what the world average of youth LFPR is? Well, for overall, it's 48%. For females, it's 49%. Where are we? Youth LFPR, 24 and a half. We're at half of the world average. We have no choice but to provide jobs to these girls who are all wanting jobs. They've all gotten better educated. There's just no question about it. In addition, of course, You've got the stock of unemployed, the stock of needs. I talked about the 100 million needs. If you don't, you see, in his 7 million, he's not including needs. He's only including the unemployed and those who are entering. 
He is not evil, including those we have to pull out of agriculture. I am saying we have to pull workers out of agriculture. First, remove the 60 million we pushed back in the last three years. In addition, we have got to take more out. And honestly, if we just manage to push back to, uh, the absolute number of workers to agriculture in the next in agriculture in the next five years, back to 200 million, the agri uh, share of total workforce. Because the workforce is growing, something like 10 million. The agri share will already drop to 30%. That's a remarkable improvement from where we are at 45. We need to get there, no question about it. Absolutely, non-farm jobs have to be created. Third, higher load. I tried to investigate this whole question about 17, 18, 18, 19 data. ILO has not, ILO headquarters raised this issue. ILO, India country office never raised this issue. Uh, India country office is going berserk asking the ILO country, uh, global office, what the hell were you guys talking about, the, you know, qu raising question marks about these two years data? They have not come up with an answer yet. We are still waiting. So, you know, let's not sort of jump the gun and come to our own conclusion. Fourth, LFPR, female LFPR. Forget about C CMI. I didn't use CMI at all. I don't care about what the, C the CMI data is saying, but let's just look at what the female LF LFPR currently is. We have no choice but to ra raise that female LFPR. On the what the women are and, and, and the, the additional 60 million workers are doing in agriculture. I have that estimate right here and I'm showing it to uh, to Monte a minute ago. And let me just show you what, what it's telling us. What it's telling us is the following. Yes, that the share of livestock in total workforce in agriculture has gone up. It's gone up from, uh, with, with the numbers has, 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 has gone up from in 2012, it was about 10 million, it's gone up to 23 million, 13 million. Yet at the same time, when you get a massive increase of workers in agriculture, what you also see, begin to see is that, seven, that 71 million workers are still in non perennial crops, and there's been an increase in that since 2012. In perennial crops, there's been an increase. So, in other words, both perennial and non perennial crops is seeing an increase. Because what the hell are they going to do? Their modern productivity is pretty low, as it is. Was pretty low, even when there were 200 million workers. They've gone back. They have precious little to do. Some of them are running little shops. So they're probably all, and their wives are doing sort of livestock. So the fact of the matter is, we've got, uh, I'm done, my five point. Well, okay, very good. Well, uh, two questions have come from the floor. Uh, one addressed to Surjit and one addressed to Santosh. So I'm going to ask them to respond very briefly on each of these, and then we can. You want to ask a question? Yeah. On? Okay. One from the third question. Tien, fourth question. Yeah. Quickly. Uh, very quick. Two questions. Uh -huh. How does India compare to Asian and LA peers? And that begs the question, who is a peer? Uh, and that's what I try to address. Um, you can choose China as your peer, or you can choose Vietnam as your peer, or you can choose Outer Mongolia as your peer. So um, I don't like playing those games of peers, uh, that, but it is very important to establish a peer. And that's why I take an average of something like 29 countries in Asia and Latin America. On youth and employment, so young people are pursuing education that doesn't result in a job, or are they studying because they don't have jobs? Uh, this is a perennial. I, my favorite answer uh, to what's with the youth unemployment in India um, is that they're looking for a government job. And <clears throat> very simply, and that's a better job. Um, I want to illustrate, I just returned from the US, just to tell you as to the unemployment problem for educated, highly educated people. There were 600 applicants 
for one job at a curator for a museum. In Brazil, there were, and I saw the tweet, I, I think I mentioned it earlier, in Brazil, there was something like 300 applicants, or 3,000, I forget, outlandish number, for three PhDs. So guys, get real. This okay. is a big problem around the world. Yeah. One so minute. Then, Quick question. Yeah, the recent numbers show a revival of private consumption, albeit in rural areas. How do you read this situation? Well, two comments, very briefly. First, we don't know how stable this rise in consumption is. There's been an increase in uh, an improvement in agricultural growth in recent times. So it's revived and therefore it's perfectly possible. And, but the second thing is we also know that people have kept, you know, suppressed their demand. Effective demand has been latent, but, you know, not effective. People, even there, they are borrowing to buy their two wheelers and scooters, which they had postponed for quite a while. They can't postpone it any longer. It says, however, if you listen to R.C. Bhargav or any of the other competitors to R.C. Bhargav's Maruti, what you'll discover is that demand for two wheelers is still below pre-COVID levels. Okay, thanks. So I wanted to take this discussion out of the partisan. Uh, what happened in the Modi years versus what happened in the European okay. years. Well, all I'm trying to say is that since 1991, ah. India's economy has grown at around 6%, just at 6% a year. Now for a democracy, that's pretty good. However, as I think most of us have agreed, it has not created the jobs that 6% growth should have created. So it's a structural problem. And I think my, most of us also would agree that the problem is because we have not yet created an industrial revolution, which is to say that manufacturing has really let us down. Manufacturing is less than 15, 15% of GDP, 11% of jobs, employment, and less and around 2% of exports of manufactured goods. So, I mean, from a policy point of view, coming, you know, all these numbers are fine. But looking at what we're going to do about this situation, the reality is that, the, I mean, labor statistics, etc., are not really telling us the story because we've known for a long time that our problem is not unemployment, our problem is underemployment. Too many people in agriculture, etc. So that's really kind of the direction in which I would have liked the debate to go to really solve that problem. I mean, at, when I wrote India Unbound, I thought we could actually skip the manufacturing stage because the IT was going gangbusters and I thought, oh gosh, I mean, there we are. We'll skip it. I don't think any longer. Mia Kulpa. Okay. So right. that's my... Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, uh, my questions are to um, uh, Sujit. Um, I'm not sure I understand your 7 million figure. Um, if you, I, I, I agree with you that the, some of the other numbers that you quoted from Gita Gopinath and maybe even um, uh, maybe on the high side, but if you take the overall numbers, um, let's say from the census, census of 91 and a population of, I think, 850 million to today, about 1,400 you've got an addition of 550 million people. And the whole argument about the demographic dividend is that the percentage of the population between 15 and 59 is increasing. So if your population is increasing at more than 15 million a year, then your working age population should be increasing at more than that. Uh, even if you, and if then if you take something like a 60-65% um, you know, working age uh, percentage, 
you're getting at least 10, 11 million. So I don't understand your 7 million, number one. Number two, um, your numbers on um, unpaid family labor, I think showed up as a percentage of the total, uh, showed a drop uh, from what I remember of the you know, table to 2018. And it climbed after that. It dropped to about 12%, if I remember right. And it's gone up subsequently to 15%. So you were looking at a decline from the starting point to the end point and saying there's a decline, but there was actually a sharper decline and then it increased. So you didn't address that issue. Um, well, listen, I've got some questions from the floor. Uh, Richard really made a comment, an interesting one. You asked a specific question, but I don't know if uh, Sudhi is going to add to that. I just want to explain, you know, the purpose, this is in response in a way to Gautran's comment, that the purpose of the seminar was not to get into either the narrative or the future, which are very, very important. I'm quite happy, I'm sure a CSET would love to organize another seminar that would address those issues. The purpose of this seminar was that it is surprising how much difference they can be in just people's assessments of the facts. And that's why I asked them to subject you to what many of you may think, and I sometimes suspect from some of the glazed looks occasionally that they may have overdone it. But you know, it goes back to a song that was very popular when I was a kid, and most of the people here are too young. And that was the thing which which I think is Harry Belafonte, and he said, it was clear as mud, but it covered the ground, and the confusion made the mind go wrong. <laughs> so this is, this is not meant to... He also said, man smart, woman smart. Yes, that's <laughs> true. Uh, the, the point really was, the point really was that it is important for people to know that the problem is not how to explain the facts. If you just do a very narrow focus on the facts, there's a huge amount of difference. Now, I mean, I agree with you that I don't think any of them would actually, neither of them was asked to provide solutions. And it's quite possible that they completely differ with each other. What has happened? I may well agree on what should happen. There's just one point that I want to make, uh, which actually comments a little bit. You know, this, I'm a bit fed up. This is just a personal confession of inadequacy. I'm a bit fed up of the constant focus on the demographic dividend. <laughs> the whole essence of the demographic dividend derives from a world in which growth is supply constrained by the lack of labor on the assumption that demand and the rest of the system is going to be organized so that if there's labor, it will be employed. But the whole debate is at the moment that there is labor and is not adequately employed. So quite frankly, uh, there is a world in which the demographic dividend becomes important. But I suspect that that is not actually the world that we're living in. In particular, this assumption of the labor force being up to age 65. Is also, hmm? also changing. Is also changing. Exactly. So the point is that all these calculations, I mean, after all, I don't know what's going to happen, but in the United States, at least it's deemed now that if you're 80, you can't stand for president. But otherwise, they oppose, <laughs> they oppose the idea of ageism. So, you know, if you think about these labor force estimates from whatever, 65, from 65 to 80, and as you get older, the number of people who come into the labor force is quite large. So I personally think we should not be too impressed by the de demographic dividend. What is, I think, important, though, is the independent, the contribution of total factor productivity. And nobody knows what the hell that is, except that when there's growth without growth of labor uh, employed, that's total factor productivity. And this was one of the questions that somebody asked, what's going to be the effect of artificial intelligence? Those are very complicated questions, not fair to pose it to them, because I think what they, what they agreed to do was to share with you, I thought in quite a lot of detail, uh, the, the challenge in getting clear about what the facts are. And you know, all said and done, my own, to my mind, the most important thing 
in this whole thing is our real wages stagnant or not? And by the way, they differ on that. And in all probability, that's due to the choice of defrator. But in no. my mind, uh, to say that there's a lot of employment, but real wages are stagnant, means that is really, if the income is growing as much as it is growing, then real wages should be growing. Uh, according to uh, Santosh, they seem to have flattened out. According to him, they're sort of growing a little bit. No, well, on, not on the, it's not a choice of deflator. Ah, sorry. It's okay. not, it's the same deflator. Nice. This is also, I would think that that's because of that. If you know, they can see the monetary policy coming to the report. Monetary policy report. That's what enters the central bank's monetary It's not generally known that he's a secret monetarist. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, he is. So it's not a person. No, it's a very important thing. Yeah. It's very important to point out it is not a choice okay. of deflate. You should find out what it is, but it is definitely not the choice of deflator. He's using the same deflator I am. I will tell you, I will give you a hint as to what it's like. No, just tell us. <laughs> yeah. No, no. And this came up in that slide that I showed um, on the argument or the debate I had with Jean Dres on agricultural wages, on exactly this. Now, <clears throat> what he had done was taken all India inflation. Okay, so that was, whereas in my case, I have taken each, the CPI in each state inflation. So it's a relative price issue. So Bihar has, you are assuming Bihar has a much higher price level when it doesn't. So it's just plain wrong. Well, we are going to finish the subject, but we are going to finish the session. We're about two minutes over time, for which I apologize, but thank you all for coming. And thank you both.